welcome to um, another one of our wonderful interviews uh, that we've uh, we've organized for this period of lockdown thank you very much for joining us uh, whether you're here uh, online right now or whether you're here uh, watching it uh, digitally so it's been uh, been posted up on youtube but it's uh, it's lovely to have your company this evening um my, the title of my chat tonight is bouncing and coughing which is a rather disgusting title for what i reckon is going to be a really brilliant chat um obviously you all know me so my name is ollie um i'm going to be your beautiful host well you're not so beautiful host but i will be hosting this wonderful chat um and if if real life bona fide marvel action superstars is who you're looking for then you've absolutely found them in this chat this evening and i don't mean me um it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome these two fine young people uh, to our meeting this evening direct from the the front lines against the the dreadfulness that's going on outside at the moment, which we're all having to unfortunately live through, uh, and also in the protection of all of us in day-to-day -day emergencies, um, alongside their amazing paramedic colleagues, um, these guys can be relied upon to step up to the plate whenever anyone is in need. Um, every now and again, these two young people have been known to dabble in a spot of trampolining. Um, both of them have competed as part of the British Gymnastics uh, competition framework um, uh, and one of them has done the uh, trampoline and DMT league as well. So ladies and gents I give you the green jumpsuit clad superheroes, the unsung heroes of Great Britain right now, Amy West and Bishman Sivakumaran. Guys you can turn your cameras on now. Hi. <coughs> Hello. Hi Amy. Hi Bish. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> Hi. I'm sure they're uh, they're feeling a little bit nervous right now, but um, guys, thank you so much for for coming in tonight. It's uh, it really is a, a a pleasure to have have you guys. I know that uh, even though our our interview's not been organised for very long, I've already had several emails from people going, "I'm really excited to uh, to, to listen to that." So welcome to this chat this evening. For everybody, if anyone does have any. Um, questions or anything like that that you would like to put to either Amy or Bish, um, then please stick them in the chat window um, and I'll, I'll monitor them throughout this this interview um, and if there's anything that's really amazing then I'll, I'll ask you guys to unmute yourselves and then you can uh, can ask them. Um, before we get going though ladies and gents um, there's a little bit of a surprise because it's actually Amy West's 30th birthday today. <laughs> So should we give her a little round of applause? Woo! Uh, I tell you what, my lovely, you're looking very, you're looking amazing for 46. I mean, you're Thanks. doing really well. Thanks. Um, I've got a great cream. <laughs> great cream, but it's really expensive. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy Thank birthday. You Thank you very much. Thank you for, for joining us on your birthday. <laughs> so I understand you, you've, uh, you've been on shift today and yep. now you're coming back to have this chat with us. Yes, that's correct. Go birthday! Woo! <laughs> um, so you guys are both on the front line um, of emergency medicine in the NHS. Um, Amy, you work in the Avon and Somerset area and Beesh, you work in the London area. What are your actual job titles um, and how long have you been working in the NHS in, in you know, this, this kind of role? Uh, let's go with Amy first. Um, so I actually have two job titles, so I split my time between two uh, jobs um within bristol so are you, are you already guys like there's not enough oxygen in the world for amy to get through the, the sentences to pronounce her job title you have to take a big breath um so my first title is i'm a hazardous area response team lead paramedic um and then my second title uh, is that i'm an emergency preparedness response and resilience officer wow i know <laughs> wow Um, can you put that in English? What, what does that yeah. actually mean? So, uh, on my paramedics job, I go into the places that nobody else wants to go uh, because they're either dangerous or you need 
specialist qualifications to go into them. So things like rescuing people from water or who are trapped in floods, like we've seen quite recently. Um, climbers who are stuck on the side of cliffs and we need to abseil down to get to them. Um, and lots of really sort of fun, exciting things that a lot of people would love to get paid to do. <laughs> and then the second side of my job is basically I do emergency planning. So I plan um, for foreseeable events. So things like pandemics um, and uh, issues at hospitals um, or big accidents at big sporting events and things like that. So I do all the planning in advance of them. Oh, that's really interesting. Cool. OK, we'll touch on some of that um, in a little while, if that's OK. Um, Bish, what about you, dear boy? What's, uh, what's your job title? Uh, so my job title is emergency ambulance crew. And what does um, that mean? And that just means I work on uh, frontline ambulances responding to 999 calls. That, that's two, two very different job roles. Um, not, 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 not as exciting as Amy's. <laughs> <laughs> just as important, e equally as important. Um, there's, yeah, the, the, both of your job roles have fantastic and far reaching effects for the people that you work with. Um, so th for, let's get it out of the way right now. Thank you both of you for everything that you guys do. Um, and you can take that thanks back to all of your colleagues as well, because like we all, we all think that you're amazing. Um, Bish, um, I reckon all of us probably take our health and the health of the nation kind of a little bit for granted, I think. Um, you know, the NHS, it, oh, the NHS is, is, is always there. Oh, <laughs> uh, hello, hello. I need to hit you, Daddy. You need to hit me, brilliant, thanks for that. <laughs> oh, when I'm in the middle of my meeting. Can you say, can you say hello to everyone? Hi. Uh, to everyone, this is my little uh, my little monkey moo Aurora. Uh, but now you've got to say bye bye because uh, you need to need to let me crack on. Is that all right? Mommy, I need to die, Can you say bye bye to everyone? Bye, everyone. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just say my daddy. That was amazing. <laughs> okay. Well, where do we get to? So, Beesh, so I reckon that we take our health um, and the NHS to a certain extent. I reckon we take that for granted a little bit. The fact that oh, the NHS is always going to be there, you know, free health care. Um, uh, this, the NHS, it happens um, because people like you, people like Amy, um, you know, real people in the real world, you step up and you step forward and you hold your hand up in the air and go, I'm going to do that. I'm going to look after everybody. Um, can you explain in your job role while you're stepping up and being like a superhero, um, what your day to day role within an ambulance, um, what that looks like and, and what your roles and responsibilities are? Um, sure. So coming in the morning uh, or the evening, whatever time we're starting. Um, check the ambulance over, make sure we've got all the kit we need, make sure it's roadworthy, uh, book on with control, and then we um, wait for our first call, which uh, normally doesn't take very long to come through. I can imagine, um, but working in London, I expect that you're extraordinarily busy. We are especially busy at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, so we go to the call um, and then treat our patients, see, what, uh, see what's happened and how we can help them. Roughly how many calls do you attend when you're on a shift? How, lo how long are your shifts and how many calls do you attend? So my shifts are normally 12 hours long. Um, and normally we do between about six, seven calls a day. Wow. Um, a lot of it will depend on how long, uh, what the calls are. Um, and also how long we end up waiting to um, hand over our patients at hospital. Yeah. Um, well, uh, what, so sometimes what, if you're not waiting at all, you can do eight, nine calls a day. Um, if you're waiting for long periods of time, then you do less. How obviously you work in London, uh, Bish? How many ambulances do you, are there are there in London? Um, what's the? I don't, I don't know. You're going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how many there are. Pan London. 
Um, uh, Amy, have you got a rough idea of how many ambulances there are in Avon and Somerset? Um, yeah, so I can um, account for Bristol, probably not the w wider Avon and Somerset. Um, but so on a good day, we're looking around uh, 30 to 35 um, trucks. So the big ones that you see driving around, which can actually carry patients and take them to hospital. Yeah. Um, and then around 15 of our rapid response cars. So the smaller cars that you see dotting about. Um, on a bad day, that could be as low as just a few um, of our rapid response vehicles and kind of 15 to 20 ambulances. So in reality, for the size of Bristol, um, a lot less than potentially anyone would expect. Um, so I can, uh, relating that to London, so at my station, um, at my ambulance station, we have, I think about, uh, on, a, on a fully staffed day, we'd have uh, 11 ambulances throughout the day um, and that's just my station and close to my station so within about five miles of my station and in our kind of group we've got another three stations right okay um, so just in our little area there's uh, about 30 40 ambulances wow um amy you said um on a good day and a bad day what dictates what's a good day and what's a bad day as far so, as provision of services is concerned provision um, of so the main thing is our availability of staff um so obviously with our job uh, we're exposed to lots of things um so different viruses and infections um so we do have a high level of staff sickness um through just getting unwell from things that we catch off our patients um, but then um, on top of that, we have things, uh, so mental health and the stress that's placed upon us um, quite often has our staff off um, for some period of time just whilst they try and recover. Um, there's other aspects as well, um, so things like our annual leave. Um, so we do actually have to take holidays. We're mandated that we have to take time off to uh, relax and recover. Um, but because we're chronically kind of understaffed because of our sickness levels, um, it's very difficult for us to take our annual leave. And when we do, there's kind of no one to cover us. Um, so it, it chops and changes. A pretty challenging work environment as far as that kind of thing is concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to both of you, how how did you first get involved in becoming a paramedic? I mean, what's what inspired you to, to go down the healthcare route? Obviously, Amy, you've been doing it for a um, you know a good chunk of time now, and Bish, you've um, you've been doing it for less time than Amy. But uh, but what's what was the the impetus to to make you you know get that application form and send it off? Uh, let's go, Bish first. Um. So it was, a, it was by accident, really. Um, I was uh, buying some first aid supplies for coaching. Um, and I came across an advert uh, to be a first responder, to be a volunteer in London. Um, and I did that voluntarily for about a year. Um, and I enjoyed that role. Um, so then I applied to join the service as a trainee emergency ambulance crew. Brilliant. And you're, and you're enjoying it? Uh, I am. Hard work, but enjoying it. Most of the time, yes. <laughs> um, Amy, what about you? How, how did you get started in the first <laughs> instance? Um, so I actually decided that I wanted to be a paramedic when I was about 15. Um, so around the time that I was kind of looking at my GCSEs and my A-levels and trying to decide what I was going to take. Um, and I had always known that I wanted to help people, but I didn't quite know how I wanted to do that. Um, but when I started looking into it, I looked into being a midwife and, and being a nurse and doing kind of in-hospital roles. And I just decided that that wasn't really me. I was too active. I was too um, bouncy, for want of a better um, phrase. And I didn't like the idea of being in the same place and staring at the same four walls every day. So I started to look into paramedicine, um, where obviously we're out and about and we're going into different people's homes and different environments. And that really just um, kind of got me um, and got me hooked. Um, so I took a slightly um, different route uh, in that I went straight from school to university um, to study paramedicine. Um, and so I did three years at university before coming out as a qualified paramedic. 
That was about to be one of my next questions, actually, is what do you have to do to become a paramedic? Yeah, so there's two different ways that you can do it. So you can either join the service um, as either a trainee or an apprentice um, and work your way um, up that way. And that way, all your training is paid for and you're working whilst you train. The other way is to go to university um, and do a three year course um, where you're put on placements. So you go still go out with the ambulance service, but as a student, um, and then at the end of that course, when you graduate, you get to register as a paramedic. Oh, brilliant. And, and then what about all the, uh, the the funky extra stuff that you talked about, you know, abseiling down burning buildings and, and <laughs> repelling off of helicopters and things like that? How does, how does that work? <laughs> so um, certainly in um, Southwest Ambulance Service, which is where I work and all my lights have just turned off, um, you have to be qualified as a paramedic for two years so you have to be working on the road and going out to 999 calls and treating patients for a minimum of two years um, and then you can apply for the job um, you go through quite a strenuous assessment process that kind of checks that um, you're um, suitable to do the job so they make sure that you're okay at height and okay in small spaces and things like that um, and then you do a solid six months um, Monday to Friday training doing all of your courses um to get all of the extra qualifications that you need to work in those areas that sounds pretty intense not gonna lie Woo! Yeah. It's an emotional time <laughs> I, bet it, I bet it must be really fun though and I, I suspect that for both of you guys when you're coming up through the training route you build a bond with your with your colleagues and and, and have a really fun time together yeah, definitely. So my colleagues are, are like my second family um, to the point where actually I think I spend more time with them than potentially I do uh, my own family. Um, doing 12 hour shifts um, and being in each other's company uh, means that you have to get to know each other and, and get on and work together. Um, so, yeah, definitely um, the bond is massive. Uh, remember, everyone, if you've got a, uh, a question that you'd like to ask um, Bish or Amy, then please stick it in the uh, in the chat window. We'll uh, we'll we'll put them to them. Um, to both of you, I was having a chat with uh, one of my other daughters, not the one that invaded our interview, the slightly big one. Um, and she wanted to know. She had a really good question. She wanted to know um, how you both coped um, when you're working on a patient at a, a nine 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 scene, and you know that they're in you know a lot of pain. They're in excruciating pain, and they're they're you know obviously not very happy. How do you deal with that, knowing that someone is you know suffering in front of you? How do you how do you deal with that, and what's your sort of response? Uh, Beesh, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Um, sort of knowing that you're there to help them, and that if you weren't there, they'd still be in pain, and that you could do something to try and alleviate their suffering. Um, that sort of that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then, um, yeah, just doing everything we can to help them, giving them pain relief, um, trying to reassure them that we're going to help them and take care of them. I'd imagine that you've got a, a, a fun bag of drugs in your uh, ambulance. Uh, yeah, depending on who I'm working with. <laughs> <laughs> um, from the moment you rock up on scene, uh, how quickly can you get pain relief on board to a, a patient that's in, um, in you know, pretty, uh, pretty dire circumstances? Um, Pretty quickly, so we can uh, depend. It, dep it depends on what's causing the pain, um, and uh, what drugs we can give. But we could give um, we could give drugs that you could just breathe in, so um, gas and air, um, and that takes effect quite quickly. And um, it, it's just setting it up and giving it them, uh, giving it to the patient to um, sort of suck in. And that, uh, that could be that very gas, don't they? I, I have to say, I mean, I've seen gas and air administered on several occasions, but I've never seen anybody laughing while they're taking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why it's called gut laughing gas, but um, it, it does work. It's very effective. Uh, Amy, what about you? Um, uh, any any uh, sort of second thoughts when you're walking onto a scene and there are you know, patients in obvious pain? Yeah, so it's um, ex exactly the same thing. The fact that you know that you're there and that you have the ability to help them and make them feel better um, is what gets you there. And there is no better feeling than uh, once you've, you've been at a job and you've had a patient who is in a lot of pain and is very unhappy, when you get them to the point where they're talking and potentially even laughing and having a bit of a joke with you and they're a completely different person to when you got there 
all based on on what you've done and how you've been able to help them it's the best feeling in the world um, and you can't help but feel humbled that someone's allowed you into their life um, and allowed you to do things that are, are effectively intimate in the sense of walking into their house when you're a complete stranger um, and letting them help you um, is amazing there's no feeling like it I'd imagine uh, that for, for both of you guys, you've obviously received a huge amount of specialist training. Um, is there ever a time when being on a scene or on a job has ever kind of got too much for you or, or does the training, you know, kick in and you're, you, you just kind of crack on with the job? Has it, have you ever come across that moment where you're like, oh, I can't do that? Uh, Beast, do you want to go first? Um, I've come across times where I've been stressed and worried. Um, and I've just kind of had to take a step back, take a moment to breathe, work out what I'm doing, and then um, crack on again. Um, I think we, we've always got the option of taking people to hospital most of the time, which, so if there's nothing else that I can do, I can do what I can to get them on the ambulance and get them to hospital where someone else will be able to help them. Yeah. Um, so that's always in the back of my mind and that's always something that I can rely on. Um, uh, Amy, what about you, my lovely? Yeah, so um, it's actually, it's a recognised um, thing in healthcare and um, we call it bandwidth and it's about how much you can handle and as a situation becomes more and more stressful, your ability to handle stuff becomes smaller and smaller. Um, and it's something that we all experience and we do get training um, about how to kind of expand that back again. Um, and it's exactly what um, Beast just said about taking a step back and taking a breath. Because um, at the end of the day, we are all human um, and it's, it's an emotional thing that we're stepping into and it can become too much. Um, we have the added um, bonus as well of always having access to doctors. Um, so things like the air ambulances um, that no doubt you'll have seen um, around or flying through the air. So they've got specialist doctors on who carry additional uh, medicines and pain relief, but they can also provide us advice when we think we just don't know what we're dealing with. Um, so that's always a nice little reassurance. You've, um, you've done stuff with the air ambulance uh, as part of your job, haven't you, Amy? Yeah. Uh, what's it like flying around Bristol in the, in the, <laughs> it's, in the, big, in the big green chopper? It's pretty exciting. Um, I'm not the best flyer, um, but once you um, get <laughs> over the fact that you're hovering 2,000 feet above the ground, it's a beautiful, beautiful sight. Um, it's very exciting. It's not something that happens every day. Have, uh, have you ever had to engage the old uh, sick bag routine up in the chopper? No, not personally. <laughs> Uh, any of your colleagues? Not that I'm aware of. To be fair, you guys are probably made of stronger stuff than the rest of us. So um, yes. I'm not sure that anyone will admit to it if it has happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'd hold my hand up. I think I'd, I'd be... <laughs> Ask me the sick bag. Thanks very much. Have we got another one? Let's have it. I'll need a spare. <clears throat> Um, you guys have both been, I feel quite sure, to a, a, a huge number of jobs um, across your career uh, within the ambulance service. Um, I don't want you guys to go in any, you know, into any gory detail or anything like that, but um, I wonder whether both of you could um, sort of describe the, the craziest scene that you've been on where you're just kind of stood back going, oh my God, what is going on? Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, sort of what, what's a window into uh, into your lives as paramedics is what you could experience on this job. Uh, Amy, if you go first. Oh gosh, I'm trying to think. There's so many that just are super weird. Um, so one very, very recently um, was a job where I went to, it was registered as a campsite, but I think it was more of a kind of Glastonbury vibe a bunch of people living in a in a campsite together kind of full time um and when we turned up there was like boats that were turned upside down that people had turned into their houses um and like loads of really random stuff like that um and it turned out that a guy had been bitten on the face by a rat um which 
is like the weirdest thing in the world how you get bitten on the face by a rat um and we were like clearing him up and he had blood all over his face and when we kind of got down to the wound um he had two little tiny teeth marks on his cheek and it was just surreal and it's something that I never thought that I would have to deal with <laughs> Because, uh, of course, we all uh, have our pet rats that we put on our faces all yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah. Wow, wow. Uh, Beesh, what about you, dear boy? I'm trying to think, and I can't think at the moment. Um, there's so many odd and weird things that we go to. It's, it's hard to just sort of pick one. Uh, I, I, I'm not a paramedic, you know, do you know what I mean? I'm... I, <laughs> I've got my first aid certificate and all that kind of stuff, but um, I, I seem to be pulling people out of cars and, and scooping them up all the time. It's always on the portway as well, not being funny. <laughs> um, I was driving home the other night and there was a car on its roof in the verge on the portway and uh, I had to pull the driver out and I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to remember how to do CPR and all of that kind of stuff. And fortunately he was okay. But That, uh, that must have been quite scary. Oh, e even as a, as a non paramedic person it's um the, the world can go crazy sometimes can't it mm. you have just reminded me of the baby that i delivered on the side of the road um whilst dealing with a motorcycle accident wow um, were you um I, I didn't know that you were pregnant huh. <laughs> um, so i was dealing with a motorcyclist who had come off on the road um and we were just putting him into the back of the ambulance when i heard a load of screaming down the road um, and it was basically the father of the baby who was trying to get through the traffic to get to the hospital with his wife that was in labour. Um, so I'd gone from picking a motorcyclist up off the side of the road to about 25 seconds later delivering a baby uh, in a car. Um, so that's kind of how quickly our strange world can change. Wow. Was it a boy or a girl that was uh, delivered? It was a little girl. Did, did uh, they name it Amy? No, they called it Mia, which is just, uh, you know, a swap around of my letters. So I'm still claiming it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she is named after me. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you for those experiences, you guys. Thank you. Let's um, let's move our, our conversation um, a little bit. Let's move it towards trampolining. Um, both of you uh, at some point or another or still currently have been involved in trampolining at some point in your lives. Um, I wonder whether you might just let everyone know um, what your experience has been, um, what you've done within the sport, um, where it was with, where it was, who it was with, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Beach, do you want to go first? I got involved in trampolining maybe around when I was about seven. So long time ago now um, with Howard Trampoline Club. Um, where I was jumping. Uh, I became a coach there uh, and I judged as well. What level trampoline coach are you? Uh, so I've uh, done my performance coach course. Um, still need to do my exam for it. Um, but yeah, so I've done that. For, for those of you who um, don't necessarily know what all the different qualifications are, um, there's uh, the Proficiency Award Scheme Coach course, which is the, 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 the foundation level. There's UKCC Level 1, UKCC Level 2, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4. Then you've got to do a, um, a big portfolio called a Coaching in Context module. And then there's Performance Coach. So that's pretty high up the tree, B, you're not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been. Uh, I've judged. I'm a county level judge, um, and I also coach DMT. So I wow. coach DMT at London DMT and do a little bit of trampoline coaching there as well. Um, I don't really jump anymore. I just bounce around if I get the chance. Um, and uh, I also help out at the uh, trampoline league events now. Um, where That's I help the, the uh, medical cover. The, the trampoline and DMT league that's uh, the, the, the national competition series. I uh, helped set up some of the events and uh, uh, I helped provide some of the medical cover. So if anyone gets injured. 
<clears throat> for, uh, for for the benefit of the uh, of everybody watching, um, I've I've helped Beeshman um, carry some of his equipment in from uh, from his car. He he gets he gets very precious <laughs> over his gas. <laughs> He's like, well, I'm not. I'm not sure if uh, if I can trust you to take these because they're they're very they're very secure. They're, you, oh, well, I'm not sure you're a very trustworthy <laughs> person, Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's, uh, it's very funny watching you watching you be su super serious uh, because uh, because no normally you're very very fun loving, which is a very, <laughs> very stark contrast. Um, but it's really gr good to see that you you know you take that side of your job very very seriously. So. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Um, Amy, what about you, my love? What's uh, what's your bouncy history? Um, so I have been bouncing since I was six or seven, I think, and I started off uh, just doing a recreational class at a leisure centre um, on sort of school holiday camp um, type thing. From that, I decided that I really enjoyed it and I started going to uh, North Bristol Trampoline Club, uh, which was run by uh, the late, great Paul Harris. Um, and that... Mr. M Mr. Paul, uh, yeah, Paul, Paul Harrison, we, we miss him very greatly. Yeah. Um, from that, I met this one. Um, Hi! <laughs> Hi. Um, who was coming along and doing a little bit of coaching here and there. Um, started from that going to Thornbury Trampoline Club. Um, so again, still rec, but they were doing sort of uh, internal competitions and things like that. Um, and then when, as it was, Evolution uh, started in Bristol, I joined then and I must have been 11 or 12 at that point um, and started competing um, and then, so we're still around when it turned into Axis and I carried on bouncing uh, until I was 18, which is when I went off to uni. Um, so Ollie's known me since I was about this big. Um, <laughs> I, old money, uh, was a senior club coach, so that's 3.4, 3 uh, county judge, um, was doing some coaching for Axis and also for some of the recreational clubs around Bristol, um, and when I can, um, I still come along and, and have a bit of a bounce and use it as a bit of a fizz session um, for me um, and to try and keep my hand in. Uh, we won't tell anybody about the uh, time that you came to Axis and uh, and fell off the tumble track and broke your ankle. We won't no, tell anyone. No, we won't talk about that. <laughs> Amy, should we uh, should we call you an ambulance? No, don't call an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> never call me an ambulance. Whatever's happening to me, my <laughs> colleagues will Same never here. Have it down. <laughs> Um, what's your what's been your greatest and proudest achievement in trampolining both of you uh amy what's uh what's if if you want to look back because i know that you don't trampoline you know very often anymore but certainly you did it an awful lot as you were growing up looking back on your trampoline career what was the the best thing about that time um so for me it was it was um having effectively another family i had a place away from my home and away from school where i belonged um, but it wasn't people that I had to spend time with. It was people that I wanted to spend time with. Um, and it formed pretty much my entire teenage world um, coming to training. And I've still got friends that I, you know, 10 years later, still talk to on a weekly basis and, and catch up with um, and kind of made some lifelong friends. Um, so for me, that was the, the most important thing was a, a place where I could be me relieve some stress, see my friends and have a load of fun doing it. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. Bish, um, what about what about you, my friend? I, th I think it's exactly the same for me. Um, I would I, I would jump five, six times a week um, and I just loved it. Um, the feeling of being up in the air was just amazing. Um, and the people that I would do with, the coaches, the friends I made, um, again, lifelong friends, and um, it was a really good community and really good club where um, I felt part of, and uh, it was good to be part of something. Um, yeah. Wow. 
I'll tell you what, you guys, I reckon that we could, uh, if we could take some of the words that you just said, I reckon we could put them up on a poster with your face next to it. You could be the, the, <laughs> the poster children for trampolining, just to say how amazing, you know, trampolining and gymnastics to say how amazing it is and the benefit that you get from being part of a club like ours. It's, um, yeah. oh, well done, you two. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Beachman, uh, obviously you're the um, emergency um, you know, the lead emergency practitioner at the Trampoline and DMT League. Um, and obviously you're there in that capacity with your NHS hat on, with your paramedic hat on, um, and your big bottles of gas that you hug as you walk around the room and all that kind of stuff. Um, do you think that your knowledge as a medical practitioner, so your knowledge of trampolining um, and trampolines and how they work and the, the rebound characteristic and all that kind of stuff. Do you think that having that gymnastics trampolining knowledge makes you a better trampoline accident emergency practitioner? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you deliver your medicine to people yeah, in, a, does. in a better, more considerate way because you know about trampolines? Yeah, I think it does because you understand the mechanisms and the forces involved. Um, and potential injuries more than people who aren't involved in trampolining. Um, and it's just simple things like, you know, how a trampoline works. So we, um, I think as ambulance people, we love walking and just throwing our bags around because they're very heavy bags that we carry around. Um, and I've, I've, I've seen it done before, not by myself, but um, <laughs> where an ambulance crew has walked in, you know, just... Disclaimer, disclaimer, it wasn't me, Governor, honest. <laughs> just throw their bag onto the trampoline and someone's uh, lying there with a broken ankle or a broken arm or whatever and um <laughs> and the whole trampoline moves and it causes them pain um and you know things about um putting stuff underneath the trampoline to bring it up and make it stable for working on um and you just you're more experienced with some of the injuries that happen um and you know what what tends to hurt more and what doesn't that sort of thing yeah yeah. Um, have either of you ever had to attend a shout at a trampoline and gymnastics club or a trampoline park? Because um, obviously they're very similar. Have either of you have to go to a, any of those places? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went to a I went to a girl who um, torn her ACL um, and had a what, knee injury. What's the, what's the ACL? Um, it's a ligament that runs um, in your in your uh, knee. Uh, very important ligament. Um, that's really painful if Dear. that's uh, if that's torn. Dear. Uh, 10 house points to anyone if uh, if they got that it's the ACL stands for anterior cruciate ligament. Um, <laughs> whoa, whoa. Um, Amy, what about you? Have you been to a trampoline park? Yes. Um, so I've been to trampoline parks. We've actually got three or four on our patch and they're actually really complicated um, in terms of you know managing to get people out of things like pits um, which if you don't understand what they are and kind of how how uh, to navigate them can be really really difficult um, so sort of the techniques um, like Beach was saying for sort of getting on a trampoline and not causing loads of movement the same things can apply um, to pits and, and trying to get people out um, so in my role uh, sort of hazardous area wise although it's not a you know, a special um, sort of hazard that requires special um, qualifications. We do quite often go out um, to those kind of jobs. Um, and I actually ended up writing a, a, a training package, which got rolled out for the whole of the Southwest on how to extricate people from uh, foam pits. Um, is, is it not a case of just sort of diving in and, um, you know, yeah. slinging them over your shoulder and then out you get? Am I, uh, am I being naive? very naive um, <laughs> very very complicated not the first time that accusation has been thrown at me <laughs> <laughs> so very similar to uh, on trampolines about creating stable platforms about finding ways to get kit and equipment in there without losing it to the bottom of the pit um all of those sort of things that need to be thought about and if you've never been in one then you probably don't realize that you're about to lose everything out of your pockets and lose your shoes and your socks at the same time uh, I believe, uh, well, I know that speaking to other foam pit uh, owners, so the owners of other gym clubs that have got foam pits, the weird and wonderful things that we find at the bottom of a foam pit, like watches and necklaces and glasses and false teeth and, you know, things like that. It's, uh, yeah, 
you, you find the contents of a paramedic's pocket uh, lurking yeah. at something, that would be bad. <laughs> Um, okay, let's 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 ch change tack away from from trampolining a little bit. Remember, anyone, if you've got any questions, please um, put them to put them to the guys. Um, having spoken to you guys both independently, obviously before before this um, this interview, uh, and and bearing in mind that you both work in completely different areas of the company, you know, in, in, of the country. Sorry. Uh, so, Amy, you're obviously in Bristol, and Bish, you're in London. Um, I understand that um, that both of you are feeling that the NHS is under increasing pressure and increasing strain due to uh, you know the effects of covid um Bish, what would you say to um you know members of the public that you know that the, the virus oh it's a hoax you know there's nothing to be scared of you know we don't need to be wearing masks or anything like that um what would you what would you say to to those people i mean what's what is what's the reality what's going on um i think although it's rare um People who are young, people who are healthy, do become really, really unwell with COVID. Um, it does happen often, but we've seen it and we know it does happen. Um, and also the sort of the wider effect of COVID on the rest of the NHS means that it's really hard for some people to get the treatment that they need. Um, you may not be directly affected by COVID and you may not get very ill from COVID, but you may get ill from something completely different. You may fall down the stairs, break your ankle, um, be involved in a car accident, uh, you know, just stuff that you can't predict like heart attack strokes. And like speaking for the ambulance service in London, um, we're under so much pressure. We're really, really busy um, because of the amount of work that we're doing at the moment for COVID patients and non-COVID patients. Yeah. Um, so the wait for ambulances can be really long. Um, and then when you get an ambulance, what, the wait that, at hospitals are really long. What sort of length are we talking about for a, for a wait for an ambulance? I mean, it depends, but it could be it could be a few hours for things that normally get a response within sort of 20, 30 minutes. Um, so it's very, very busy at the moment. Um, and then when you get to hospital, there could be hours long waits waiting for a bed to become available. Um, and then just because you get into hospital doesn't mean that um, you'll be seen straight away and doesn't mean that you'll have, if you need surgery, you'll have surgery straight away um, because theatres might be busy. Uh, there may not be beds available in intensive care. Um, and it's just the, it's the general effect on the NHS that COVID is having mm. that you, you may not be worried about what happens if you get if you catch COVID? But there's so many other things that people rely on the NHS for, for everyday sort of medical problems, conditions that happen, um, things to do with their GP surgery. But everyone is under so much pressure that it affects all of that. Yeah. Um, and so and so you know I if uh, I would be worried about that, I'd be worried that um, the NHS may not be able to see me as quickly as they would without COVID or as effectively. Uh, because of how much pressure it's under at the moment. So, um, so that the message is be be super careful right now. Hold, yeah. hold on to the banister with both hands when you're walking down the stairs. Stay at home, follow the rules, and hopefully things will start getting a bit better. Yeah. Um, Amy, what about the the Nightingale hospitals? Um, obviously, the government was super proud to announce. Uh, the building of them um are they ready to go you know what's what's their status because obviously uh, we've, got, we, we've got one in bristol and obviously we've got one in london as well with the yeah. uh, uh the one it's in the excel center isn't it and the, the yes, one in, yeah in the excel center the, the one in bristol is uh, on the uh the ue site yeah. so um so what's uh what's the state of play with them um, so the Nightingale hostels are built, um, they are on standby, so they can be turned on within 72 hours. So if the pressure on the system becomes incredibly high, um, or as kind of the, the south of England, we run out of intensive care beds for patients, there is the option for us to transfer all of our patients out um, to the Nightingale hospitals. But the problem is, we don't have an unlimited amount of staff and ITU nurses, my hat comes off to them. They are so special. 
um, and very, very well trained at what they do. It's not a case of just getting any nurse in to do it. You have to do a lot of extra training. Um, and in order to staff the Nightingale hospitals, we need those nurses. My light's gone again. Um, and so it's a bit of a catch 22 because if the hospitals are so over capacity that we need to open the Nightingales, it means we need to take staff away from hospitals that are already struggling. So they are there, they are of benefit because it does give us the extra beds, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you will have the normal level of ITU care if you end up in the Nightingale. So ITU normally has a ratio of one patient to one nurse. Um, if they're currently on ITU working to one, uh, four patients to one nurse, if we had to open the Nightingale, it could potentially be 10 patients to one nurse. Wow, that's, so, a ma that's a massive change. Yeah, so it's got massive implications. So although you may have a bed, it doesn't mean that you are out of the woods because we would, as an NHS system, have to look and see actually what level of care we're able to provide. And just to add on top of kind of what Beast was saying, um, you have to remember that we're all people and we're not exempt from the rules. If I get a temperature tomorrow, I can't go to work. I have to stay at home for 10 days. So if you take that across the entire system, every nurse, every doctor, um, every paramedic that gets a temperature or starts to get a cough will not be at work for 10 days. So that's also having a massive effect on our ability to provide care. Um, and I think everything that, that Beef said is 100% correct. The best thing that we can do is follow the advice and you know follow the rules. Just because you don't get symptoms doesn't mean that you haven't got the virus. It just means that you haven't got symptoms. And that means that you can pass that virus on to everybody that you come into contact with and they can pass it on to everyone that they come into contact with. And it may be that none of you get really ill, but if one of you gets really ill, then, you know, that's adding to, to the pressure that we face. That's um, a, a really stark description, I think, of what's going on right now. And I think that that answers um, Grace's question. She uh, she put in the chat window, how has your work changed due to COVID? Um, I think that, uh, that those two, you know, very brief um, discussion points have, have exemplified um, in, in very real terms the, the differences that has happened to... The work that you guys can do what your how that's changed your shift and what that you know how many shouts you can go out from because of the time restrictions that have been placed on your ambulance and access to, to hospitals and whatnot and then just staffing availability for those people under your care and oh yeah that's covid is kind of we talk about it ripping set bits of our society to pieces you know the, the hospitality industry and the entertainment industry but it's also drastically changing the how the nhs fundamentally works as well but uh, well, you guys are, are doing a doing a great job. Let's uh, let's ask a couple of questions that are a little bit more lighthearted. Um, Lily, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your uh, ask your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you each have a favourite trampoline move? Um, I think my favourite trampoline move when I when I could do it would have been a half out. Uh, would you like to describe what that is, Beastman? There, sure. there are some people watching who may not know what that means. Yeah. So it's a double front somersault with a half twist out of the second somersault. So a double front with a half twist out. So could you could, could you do the half out? Yes. Yeah. Could you could you link it? Could you half out double back? I think I may have attempted it once <laughs> or twice. <laughs> Did you have to call one of your colleagues afterwards? Um, no, that's only happened once. <laughs> uh, we, we, we won't go into too much detail on that. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, where's Riley? Uh, Riley, Riley, Riley. Do you want to come and ask your question, Riley? Because that's, that's, really that's a really He's good That's He's feeling question. a bit shy, so I'm going to ask it for him. I want to he hear would, no, shush, please. He would like to know how fast the ambulances go. <laughs> good, good question. 
Amy, go on, go for it, my love. Um, so our big trucks, the ones that can carry our patients, if we're lucky, um, and obviously without any patients on board, we can get kind of around 95, 100-ish miles an hour. Um, the rapid response vehicles, um, which are the, the cars, um, probably safely 110, 120 on a motorway, but we never really tend to drive that fast because even though we might be capable and our vehicles might be capable, um, we can never be 100% sure that something isn't going to happen. Um, so we we don't actually tend to go that fast. Um, obviously, you've uh, you've Amy specifically you you've done a, a chunk of work with, um, with with the helicopters and stuff. How fast do the helicopters go? <laughs> <laughs> um, very fast um, is the answer. Um, so you can't really compare them to ground speed, um, but they um, they can do. I think it's it's something like. Uh, 50 miles in about 15 minutes so they have got some cracking speed on them um, but I don't know what that relates to in terms of uh, ground speed. Um, did you ever have the opportunity to stand on the um, you know the, the, the legs that sit on the floor hanging out of the door uh, with playing the music from Apocalypse Now did you ever have the chance? <laughs> no it, it's not recommended it's not a particularly safe maneuver. Do you know um, what, you, you, if you, you write the manual do you know what I mean you could include that. <laughs> I'll, I'll pitch it I'll see what they say. Okay okay brilliant 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 brilliant. Um, ben and Tash do you want to unmute yourselves and ask your question that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, I was just wondering if either of you had had to stay off work because you had COVID symptoms, and if so, then how many times? Does it happen quite frequently, or is it? Uh, yeah. Good, good question. You know, the, the, ha, has this pandemic affected you guys directly? Um, yeah, so I've been off twice um, with COVID symptoms. Um, we're very, very lucky that to try and get us back to work, we have quick access to. Uh, getting swabs um, but those results still take two or three days to come through so luckily for me I was negative on both occasions um, and I was back to work within sort of four or five days once I was feeling a bit better um, but I've had colleagues um, one of my colleagues who tested positive um, who then got something called long covid syndrome uh, where his symptoms didn't stop after he was negative um, and he's been off for three months now I think um, Boo. Uh, what about you, Bish? Um, I haven't. I've been off uh, because my mum had a uh, cough. Um, this was back in March, so uh, I isolated uh, with her, um, and then um, she tested negative. So I went back to no back to work, um, and I haven't had any symptoms myself. Good. Good. Whew. Um, brilliant. That was a, that was a, a good bunch of questions, you guys. Thank you very much. Um, I, I've only got just one, one more question, really, and and it's it's a takeaway message. Um, I think it's been brilliant to have you guys on, and we can talk about um, you know trampolining and what being part of a, the trampolining and gymnastics community can bring you, and that's fabulous. And then to to provide you know really good role models to to young people about um, what life choices you can make and how you can you know take a vocational career to help others and, and be in the service of other people which is a brilliant thing to do um, and obviously we've talked about covid and the effects that that's having you know at the moment um, and how that affects you guys as as nhs frontline staff um, but if there's one thing one message that you guys would like uh, everybody watching both you know live now and um, in the in the, the people watching in the future when this is uh, recorded back um, what what's your take-home message for for everybody as far as um, where we're at right now Amy you go first hmm. um, so my take-home message is to stay safe follow the rules they're not being just made up for the sake of it they are there for a reason and the end is in sight. We now have three vaccines, uh, which are all being given uh, to everyone that's high risk. So certainly we're, you know, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel and everything will go back to, to normal um, as we know and love it. But enjoy this time, spend it with your family um, and create those bonds 
because once our lives become super busy again, we'll realize actually how little time uh, we have uh, to devote to, to the things that we really love just because of things that life uh, throws at us. So whilst it all seems a bit weird um, and there's a lot of things that we'd rather be doing, cherish it uh, because once it's gone, you'll miss it loads. Brilliant. Thank you, Amy. Beach, par parting words for everybody? Um, I think very much the same. Um, just follow the, follow the guidance, follow the rules, and that will all help us uh, kind of get out of this sooner. Um, and whilst you're doing that, just look after each other because it's, you know, we know it's difficult not doing the things that you love doing and the stuff that you normally do. And it's a big difference to the way you normally sort of live your lives. Um, so just be there for one another and um, take care of each other and be supportive. Um, that's, yeah. That's absolutely brilliant. Oh, bless, bless both of you. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, do you want to uh, bring yourselves off of mute for a, for a, a couple of moments? Um, that would be marvellous. And shall we give, with a uh, rapturous noise, shall we give a big round of applause to A? <laughs> um, give you that round of applause, uh, not only for appearing to, here tonight in our, in our interview, but for all the amazing work that you guys do uh, on the front line and the, the sacrifices that I, I absolutely know that you, both of you will have made um, in the, the, the service of looking after us. So thank you very, very much. Um, I've really enjoyed tonight's chat. It's been, uh, it's been really, really, really good fun. Um, I hope that you two have enjoyed it as well. I have indeed. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I, I'd be, uh, <laughs> wouldn't be very good if you both went, nah, it wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us. No, no worries at all. Thank you so much for joining us. Ladies and gents, um, Amy West and Bishman Sivakumaran, uh, two amazing human beings, uh, clad all in green just for you. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>